Thank you very much. Can you, uh, we've got another microphone, but can you hear my voice? It's not that big a room. Oh, great. Yeah, I mean, anthropology has always had an activist element going right back to Franz Boas. Hi, how's your arm? Oh, this is a wonderful young woman. Um, but, but the way you travel, it's amazing there's anything left of your body. I mean, I've never seen anyone travel like this woman. Fantastic. Anyway, um, you know, it's always had this activist element. I mean, Ruth Benedict, uh, one of his great students, said that the entire purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. And in, in that sense, anthropology really is the antidote to Trump and to all the nativism that is the curse of the world, the cultural myopia, which has been the really curse of humanity since the dawn of consciousness. And so having been taught in very much in that tradition, my main advisor at Harvard, I, I was very lucky to actually have two. Um, of course, a legendary botanical explorer, Richard Evan Schultes, who was one of the first to speak about the plight of indigenous people in the Amazon and the fate of the forests themselves. And of course, the other I had in social anthropology was David Mayberry Lewis, who founded Cultural Survival. Uh, I remember, in fact, one night when the Dalai Lama first spoke in the West, he wrapped up his tour at Harvard, and across the way, even as he spoke in Sanders Theater, E.O. Wilson, the great biologist, was introducing a guy called Norman Myers, who had written a book called The Sinking Ark, which was the first book to anticipate the biodiversity crisis. And naturally, all the kids were across the way listening to His Holiness. And in, in apologizing to the sparse audience in the lower lecture hall, E.O. Wilson, who's as decent and kind a man and as uh, fantastic a biologist who's ever lived, literally said, and I quote, if even Harvard students can't get their priorities right and they'd rather be across the way listening to that religious kook, you know how far we've got to go to educate the public at large. But that was actually indicative of the chasm that existed at the time between social anthropology and the natural sciences. And I probably was the only student that night racing back and forth between the two talks because from the very fiber of my being, I clearly understood that the same forces that were causing the erosion of biological diversity were responsible for the death of culture. And one of the really great pleasures of doing ethnographic work is the unabashed joy of being able to spend time amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, you know, who still feel the past in the wind, touch it in stones polished by rain, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that in the Amazon, jaguar shamans still journey beyond the Milky Way, or that in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning, or that in the high Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma, is to remember the key and central revelation of anthropology, and that is the idea that the world into which you were born doesn't exist in some absolute sense, but is one model of reality the consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that your cultural lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, a yak herder in the slopes of Chomalungma, an eagle hunter of central Kazakhstan, a thunderhoof shaman of Mongolia, all of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of thinking, other ways of being, other ways of orienting yourself in social, ecological, spiritual space. And that's an idea that, if you think about it, can only fill you with hope. Now, the myriad of cultures of the world make up a social web of life that envelops the planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as indeed is the biological web of life that we know so well as a biosphere. And in an early book, I coined the term ethnosphere to try to create an organizing principle to this cultural web of life, and I define the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and ideas, myths and memories, inspirations and intuitions brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative species. And just as a biosphere, of course, is being severely eroded with the loss of habitat and the concomitant loss of plant and animal life, so too is the ethnosphere. 
but of course, if anything, at a far greater rate. No biologist, or few, would suggest that 50% of all plants and animals are moribund. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator, of course, is language loss. When each of us were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. Now, a language isn't just vocabulary or a set of grammatical rules. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes into the material world. Every language, I once wrote, is an old growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages, by absolute academic consensus, fully half are not being whispered into the ears of infants. So we are literally living through an era when by any definition, half of humanity's intellectual, spiritual, social, ecological knowledge is being lost in a generation. And this, of course, doesn't have to happen. Now, there are many people who say, wait a minute, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be easier for us to get along? And my answer to that is always say, what a great idea. But let's make that universal language of Nuptitak. Let's make it Yoruba. Let's make it Haida. Let's make it Quechua. Let's make it Tibetan. You suddenly begin to feel, as a native speaker, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. But that dreadful fate is indeed the plight of somebody somewhere on earth every two weeks. Because on average, every fortnight, some elder passes away and carries with him or her into the ground the last syllables of an ancient tongue. Now, the reason this is so particularly poignant is that it's happening in the very generation in which science, in the glorious guise of genetics, has finally proven it to be true something that philosophers always hope to be true, and that is the fact that we're all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean, quite literally, in our lifetimes, it has been shown that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Race is a total fiction. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. We are all descendants of that same handful of people who walked out of Africa some 65, 70,000 years ago and then embarked on this amazing hegira, a diaspora 40,000 years in length, 2,500 human generations that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But here's the important revelation. If we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, all cultures by definition share the same raw intellectual genius, the same mental acuity. And whether that human potential is invested into technological wizardry, which has been the choice and the achievement of the West, or placed by contrast into the complex task of unraveling the mystic threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy in the realm of culture. That old Victorian idea that we somehow went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the strand of London, that European society occupied the apex of some pyramid that sloped down its sides to the so-called primitives of the world has not only been completely debunked, it's, sh it's been shown to be an artifact of the 19th century as irrelevant to our lives today and as meaningless as the notion that clergymen had in that era that the earth was but 6,000 years old. So in a stunning affirmation, that chasm that existed between the Dalai Lama and E.O. Wilson has been bridged by genetics. And what that really means is that the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being new. They're not failed attempts at being modern. Every culture, by definition, is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different voices. And those voices collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us as a species in the coming centuries. If there's one lesson of anthropology, it's that every culture has something to say, each deserves to be heard, just as none has monopoly on the route to the divine. The challenge becomes, what do you do about this? You know, when I was recruited to the National Geographic in 1999, 
as their social anthropologists and given the mission as part of the overarching conservation initiative at the geographic to do something about cultural diversity. It, it was tricky because, you know, if you're a biologist and you identify an area of high species endemism, you seek to create a protected area. But you can't make a rainforest park of the mind. You can't freeze people in time like some kind of zoological specimen. Change, of course, is the one constant of human cultures. And we had all kinds of meetings and brought in anthropologists and scholars from all around the world. And I, my eyes just began to glaze as they described the need for research efforts and databases and conferences. And I've always had a strong sense that politicians never lead, they only follow, but storytellers can change the world. And we were at the most powerful storytelling institution in the world. So I proposed to our team the obvious. Why don't we just go out into the ethnosphere and find those stories that are so inherently dazzling that our massive audience in 165 languages around the world, 500 million people every month paying attention to our brand, can't help but come away with a new appreciation of the wonder of culture. So for 15 years, I traveled the world looking for these points of light, these points of wonder. So let's begin this afternoon with the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination, and that, of course, is Polynesia. Tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon the southern sea. And I was fortunate to be invited by my good friend, Noah Thompson, to join the Polynesian Voyaging Society on board the Hokalea, named for the sacred star of Hawaii, a vessel that just as completed a circumnavigation of the world. And even today, the wayfinders of the Polynesian Voyaging Society can name 220 stars in the night sky. They can sense the presence of distant atolls of islands beyond the visible horizon just by watching the reverberation of waves across the hull of the vessel, knowing full well that every island group in the Pacific has its own refractive pattern that can be read with the same ease with which a forensic scientist would read a fingerprint. These are sailors who, in the darkness of the hull, can distinguish as many as five different sea swells moving through the sacred canoe, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the ocean and can be followed with the ease with which a terrestrial explorer would follow a river to the sea. Indeed, he took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. But the most amazing thing about this tradition is that it was based on dead reckoning. Now, dead reckoning means that you only know where you are by remembering precisely how you got there. Now, it was the impossibility of using that methodology that kept most European sailors hugging the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of the chronometer. But we know for a scientific fact that 10 centuries before Christ, from an ancient civilization called Lapita, the ancestors of the Polynesians set sail into the rising sun. In a, in a thousand years, they reached Samoa and Tonga from New Guinea. Then they stopped for 10 centuries. But then they sailed on 4,000 kilometers to the Marquesas, northwest to Hawaii, southeast to Rapa Nui, eventually to what we now call New Zealand. What this meant is that over the course of a multi-week journey, in a tradition that lacked the written word, the wayfinder sitting monk-like on the stern had to remember every shift of the wind, every sign of the stars, the moon, the heavens, and the sea. And if that train of knowledge broke, the journey could end in disaster. And that was the genius that allowed the Polynesians to settle the sea. Now, if we move, move from the ocean to the greatest forest, we enter the homeland of the people of the Anaconda in the Amazon, the Northwest Amazon, the Barasana and the Makuna, people who believe that mythologically they came up the Milk River from the east in the belly of a sacred serpent which regurgitated the various nations under the rivers of the Northwest Amazon, people who in ritual recite 1,600 toponyms, identifying sites all the way down the Amazon to the mouth, lands that they have never seen, but they never forget. A people who live so closely to the forest that cognitively they do not distinguish the color blue from the color green, because the canopy of the heavens is equated, equated to the canopy of the rainforest. We'll come back to the Barasana in a moment, but if we go down the Cordillera into the homeland of the Warani, a remarkable people I'd 
lived with in the late 1970s, remarkable because they lived 120 kilometers from Quito, and yet they remained uncontacted until 1958. In 1957, uh, five missionaries attempted contact and made a critical mistake. They dropped from the air eight by 10 glassy photographs of themselves and what we would say culturally to be friendly gestures, forgetting that the people of the forest had never seen anything two dimensional in their lives. So they picked up the photographs, looked behind the face to try to find the form behind it, saw nothing and concluded that these were calling cards from the devil and they promptly speared the missionaries to death. But the Warani didn't just spear outsiders, 54% of their male mortality was due to them spearing each other in intra-tribal uh, raids. But they had a knowledge of the forest that was incredible. They could smell animal urine at 40 paces and tell you what form of life had left it behind. Not because they were sauvage in a Rousseauian sense, but because they were true natural philosophers who had paid attention to the forest homeland upon which their lives depended. And this perspicacity is exactly what drew us to the Amazon. And as I mentioned, I fell into the orbit of the legendary uh, botanical explorer Richard Evans Schultes, a man who sparked the psychedelic era with his discovery of the magic mushrooms in Mexico in 1938. In 1941, he disappeared in the Northwest Amazon, where he remained for 12 uninterrupted years, living amongst unknown peoples, traveling down unknown rivers, all the time enchanted by the wonder of the neotropical rainforest. But he was a curious um, man to become a 60s icon because his politics were wildly conservative. He didn't vote for the Republican Party. He professed not to believe in the American Revolution. He always voted for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And when I was 18 and I first knocked on his fourth floor at Erie in the Botanical Museum at Harvard, I got as far as saying, Sir, I'm from British. That's all it took. One of his colleagues said the only way for Schultes to go native would be to go to London. And I said, I'm from British Columbia, and he thought I was talking about his beloved Columbia. And I said, I've saved up money in a logging camp, and I want to go to the Amazon like you did and collect plants. At the time, I had never studied biology in my life. I knew nothing about the Amazon. And rather than asking for my credentials, he simply peered across a mound of plant specimens through his antiquated bifocals and said, well, son, when do you want to go? <laughs> And two weeks later, I was in the Amazon, and just before going, he said, always remember that the difference between a poison, a narcotic, a hallucinogen, and a medicine is just dosage. Uh, and that actually is a very wise thing, because that's what you do in ethnopharmacology. You're looking for active constituents that can be used in our modern medical system um, that may or may not have anything to do with how the indigenous people have used. And the classic example, of course, is Karari, the flying death. It yielded d tubo Karari in the muscle relaxant that revolutionized surgery in the 1940s. It's, of course, used as a hunting technology in the Amazon. And this work invariably led one into the realm of the shaman. Now, if you follow the work of very famous anthropologists like Shirley MacLaine, you would believe that the shaman is a kind of benign figure with feathers and bells who sings a lot. I've been with shaman all of my career. I've never met one who wasn't a little psychotic. That's their job. They're the ones who swim in the mystic waters the rest of us would drown in. And the essence of the shamanic art of healing is the notion that disease is not caused by pathogens alone, but is a state of imbalance that must be addressed through the work of the shaman. And so the essential act of shamanic medicine is the moment in which he or she invokes some technique of ecstasy to soar away on the wings of trance to get into those very metaf distant metaphysical realms where they can work their deeds of medical, magical, mystical rescue. And that accounts for one of the most curious anomalies in botanical science, the fact that of the 120 known hallucinogenic plants, 95% are from the Americas. Not because the forests of equatorial West Africa are depaupered or the people of Southeast Asia didn't explore their forest, but they all found other avenues to the divine. But in the Amazon, and the Americas in general. The route to the Godhead is through these curious plants. Like here's a photograph Schultes took in 1954 when he first described the use of ebene, the semen of the sun, derived from the blood red resin of several species in the genus Varela. These powders are full of tryptamines, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, dimethyl... To have this stuff blown up your nose is like being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with Baroque paintings and landing on a sea of electricity. 
It creates not the distortion of reality, it creates a disillusion of reality. I used to argue with Professor Schultes that we shouldn't classify this as hallucinogenic because by the time you're under the influence, there's no one home anymore to experience the hallucinations. But why we're drawn to these plants is not simply their dazzling pharmacological effects, but what they tell us about a different way of knowing. Now there's a reason the Yanomami blow that snuff up their noses, because tryptamines are orally inactive. They can't be taken through the mouth because they're denatured by an enzyme found naturally in the human gut called monoamine oxidase. They can only be taken orally if taken in conjunction with some other chemical that momentarily denatures the MAO in the human stomach, which brings us to the most legendary of all the preparations, ayahuasca the vision vine, the vine of the soil, which is a combination of plants, the leaves of a nondescript shrub in the genus Cycotria and the Rubiaceae, and the woody bark of a liana in a totally different family of plants, which contains beta carbolines, harmine and harmline, which are MAO inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate the tryptamines in the leaves. And here's the interesting question. How, in a flora, of 80,000 species of vascular plants, did the people learn to combine these morphologically distinct denizens of the rainforest to create this biochemical version of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts? The only scientific explanation is trial and error, which is quickly statistically reduced to a meaningless euphemism. You ask the indigenous people, and they say the plants teach us. Well, what does that mean? When Schultes lived with the Siena Sequoia in 1941, he recorded 17 varieties of ayahuasca, all referable to his taxonomic eye as the same species, and yet the indigenous people recognized them consistent, consistently at great distances in the forest. And when he asked them the nature of their systematics, they looked at him as if he were a fool, because any proper student of plants would know that you took each one of the 17 on the night of a full moon, and each variety sang to you in a different key. Well, that's not going to get you a PhD in plant taxonomy here, but it's a lot more interesting in counting flower parts. And it also speaks about another way of knowing. Now, everything you ever learned about the Amazon is wrong. That the forest is fragile, wrong. The people had a tough time living there, wrong. When Aureliano went down in 1541, he described a basin with tens of millions of people, all of whom were swept away with the arrival of European diseases. When anthropologists first came into the basin, we were drawn to the real Indians, people like the Warani, living alone in isolation, in conflict with their neighbors, and that reinforced a kind of environmental notion that the Amazon was a fragile place. Well, to some extent, our analysis analysis of the way that tropical rainforests um, maintain the biological wealth in the living canopy is true, and you cut that down. Yes, all that's true to some extent, but when applied to a landmass seven times the size of Ontario, it's as much slogan as science. We now know that in the Amazon, collectively, there are areas the size of France, of rich black soil of human origins. Slash and burn agriculture may have been a post-contact in invention. What we do know is that there were great civilizations in the Amazon. And the question is, is there anywhere where we can hear their voices today? And the answer is yes. In the northwest Amazon of Colombia, where people build malocas that in their architectural and symbolic resonance rival anything the Inca and the Maya ever built. Where the people have social structures that facilitate exchange and trade, not war, not the least of which is a marriage rule that says you must marry someone who speaks a different language. And so in any one longhouse, you have six and seven languages spoken. Nobody practices. The children just one day learn to speak. Wisdom traditions that favor knowledge as opposed to war. And we now know, in fact, that the cosmologies and mythologies of these people amount to nothing more or less than a highly specific land management plan that dictates exactly how people in huge numbers could live in the Amazon. All of this was nearly lost. In 1974, when I first lived with the Barasana, it felt like a place where something important had happened a long time ago. But then an amazing thing happened. In 1985, Virgilio Barco, Colombia's president, said to a young friend of mine, Martin van Hildebrand, he's now an old friend of mine, um, do something for the Indians. 
And as head of Indian Affairs in five incredible years, Martin did more than something. He secured legal land tenure to an area of land the size of the United Kingdom for the 57 ethnicities of the Northwest Amazon of Colombia. Behind a veil of isolation created by the war in Colombia and the absence of the federal state, a whole new dream of culture was born. When we made this film for the National Geographic, Stephen Hugh Jones, head of anthropology at Cambridge, who in 1970 had predicted the end of the Barasana, the disappearance of the cultures, flew in halfway through and he saw a longhouse full of 250 men and women in full ritual regalia in the midst of taking ayahuasca for three days and three nights during the celebration of Kasava woman. He got out on the satellite phone to his wife and he called her and lunch said, you won't believe my eyes. The only thing that disappeared are the bloody missionaries. And when we asked the elders why they had tolerated the missionaries as they had, they said to us something very moving. They said, because they promised to make us human. And that's the essence of colonization, to persuade the colonized of their own inherent inferiority. That's why Justice Sinclair famously said in the reconciliation process, there are only three questions in life. Who am I? Where am I going? And where, where, have, you, where have I come from? And in the colonial interface, the authorities said to the indigenous people throughout the world that all of your answers for all of those questions, for all of your history, have been wrong. That psychological blow was equal to that of the um, physical assault from foreign disease. Now, if we move from the lowlands into the Andes, I was very fortunate to become part of what was a dream academic grant of the 1970s. A quarter million dollars, which was a lot of money then, and a brand new Dodge fire engine red pickup truck to study a plant known to the Inca as a divine leaf of immortality. And this, of course, was coca, the notorious source of, of cocaine. And it was an amazing assignment because we, even though the plant had yielded cocaine hydrochloride, then as now our most important topical anesthetic, and even though the illicit trade was beginning in the early 70s, very little was known about the plant, its point of origin, how many species yielded the drug. Incredibly, nobody had ever done a nutritional study of the plant, even though it was consumed every day by millions of South American people. We knew that in the time of the Inca, the plant had been revered as none other. Unable to cultivate it at the elevation of the imperial capital of Cusco, they replicated it in gold and silver leaf in fields that colored the horizon. We knew that today, no gesture can occur in the Andes without a reciprocal exchange of the energy of the leaf with the sacred deities of the mountains, the Apus. And I became, with coca both as my uh, and I should mention, we did do the first nutritional study of coke in 1975. What we found out horrified our backers at the U.S. government. Coca had a little bit of cocaine hydrochloride absorbed benignly in the mucous membranes of the cheek, but to control, compare coca to cocaine is like comparing potatoes to vodka. And in addition, it was chock full of vitamins. It had more calcium than any plant ever studied by science, which made it perfect for a diet that lacked a dairy product. It had enzymes which enhanced the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, perfect for the potato diet. One simple assay that could have been done in the 1920s when the efforts to eradicate the traditional fields began allowed us to show that this was a plant that had been used with no evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, for over 4,000 years in South America. And so with coca as my lens, both literally and metaphorically, I began to think of Andean notions of sacred geography. And again, I don't mean to invoke hippie ethnography. What, what does it actually mean to believe that the earth is alive? You and I were raised to believe that the mountain is a pile of rock ready to be mined. I was raised on the coast of British Columbia to believe that the forest existed to be cut. That was the foundation of the ideology of modern forestry that I was taught across the way at the Macmillan Building. That made me very different than my friends from Alert Bay raised to believe that the same forest was the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven. The question isn't whether the forest is cellulose and bored feet or is it the domain of the spirit. The interesting thing is the metaphor that propels the belief system and how that belief system mediates a relationship between a people and their landscape with profoundly different consequences for the ecological footprint. So this idea of reciprocity is the key 
dynamic in the Andes, labor exchange, spiritual exchange, a living earth that is seen before you in landslides and frosts and hailstorms and, and winds. And these rituals can be very profound. And in the community of Chincho, where I've spent, done research for over 40 years now, once each year, a fantastic thing happens. The fastest young boy in every hamlet is given the honor of becoming a woman. And he places on the clothing of his mother or his sister, and in, then he embarks on a run, a race, followed by all men in the community, but it's not your ordinary run. You start off at 11,500 feet, run 2,500 feet down to the base of the sacred mountain, and then you run to 16,000 feet, only to fall away to the sacred valley, cross two more soaring Andean ridges over the course of a 24-hour race, which is more ordeal than it is race. The Walaka must spin on the mountaintop to bring the vortex of the feminine. Libations of alcohol and coca is given to, the, to Pachamama. And the metaphor is clear. You go into the mountain as an individual, but through sacrifice, which of course has its root in the word to make sacred, you emerge as a single pulse, a community that has reclaimed both your rights to the land, but your obligation to the land. And at the age of 48, I became the only outsider ever to do the movimiento, uh, the oldest man to participate in it. And I can promise you I only got through it by chewing more coca leaves in one day than anyone in the 4,000 year history of the plant. But what really, <laughs> what really got me through it is that over 40 years I baptized dozens of kids in the community and all my godchildren, when they heard that their padrino was stupid enough to run the movimiento at the age of 48, they came out from every village and they clung to me like limpets. Uh, they weren't about to let anything happen to their cash cow. <laughs> but these localized rituals become Pan-Andean like the Koyoriti where once each year tens of thousands of indigenous people carry the crosses from their communities high into the sacred glaciers in the shadow of Ausangati, the most sacred mountain of the Inca. The crosses are planted in the ice for two days and two nights and then ritualistically reclaimed and powered by Pachamama. It's a perfect expression of the fusion of 500 years of Catholic faith together with pre-Columbian ideas. And if this syncretic reality represents a culture of Andean Peru today, there is one place in South America where the pre-Columbian voice can still be heard unfettered. And that is in this extraordinary volcanic massif, the Sierra Naval de Santa Marta, that soars to 20,000 feet out of the Caribbean coastal plain of Colombia. Descendants of the ancient Tyrone civilization, these people were never conquered by the Spanish. And to this day, they remain ruled by a ritual priesthood. But the training for the priesthood is astonishing. It was reported by Reichel Domatov, the, the great Colombian anthropologist in the 1940s, that the acolyte was taken away from his family at the age of three, sequestered in a shadowy world of darkness for 18 years, during which time he learned the Baroque religious beliefs of the society, which maintain that their prayers and rituals alone maintain the cosmic balance of the world. And then Michael said that after 18 years, suddenly the initiate is taken out on a journey to the heart of the world. And for the first time in his life, he actually sees a horizon, sees a mountain, sees the world in all of its glory. And the priest who has trained him says, you see, it's as I promised you, it's that beautiful, it's yours to protect. Now this was a fable in anthropology because Reichel it was almost too good to be believed. And Reichel was never able to witness it himself. And then something quite amazing happened. This man walked into my office at the National Geographic. His name's Danilo Villafania. He's a political leader of the Arawakos. And with him were three priests, three mamos, all barefoot in a Washington winter. And as he was chatting me up with the Colombian ambassador, I couldn't help but say to him, you know, you look a lot like an old friend of mine. And I pulled from my desk a photograph of what turned out to be his father, Alberto. And I said, Daniel, you don't remember, but when you were a baby, I carried you on my back for months with your dad up and down the mountains above your community. His dad had been murdered by the paramilitary. So this was a very emotional moment for Danilo. And based on that, he invited me to go on a journey to the heart of the world and make a film for the National Geographic. And what we discovered is that the initiates don't spend 18 years in the darkness, but they spend 18 years in the environs of the sacred temple, much of the time in 
outside at night learning this Baroque religiosity. And then they do go on a journey to the heart of the world where every ripple in the landscape resonates with significance. And you, we reached the penultimate stage of the pilgrimage when suddenly we saw the mammals in a circle. And they, the main metaphor is the loom. They say, upon this loom I weave my life. They describe their movements up and down the various ecological gradients of the mountain as threads so that over the course of a lifetime a man or a woman weaves a cloak over Saranqua. And when they pray they move their fingers like this because their prayers and thoughts are as threads. And what had happened is the FARC had discovered our whereabouts and had set us up to get kidnapped. We were happily delayed half a day reaching this hamlet. So we had to give all our film equipment to our colleagues and they finished this section of the film because we had trained them at their request. And we had to escape that night. And you don't really have a dramatic escape on a mule. You kind of clip-clop your way <laughs> to rescue. But then we ran into a firefight at dawn and we were just lucky to get away. But that wasn't a big deal. It just, we just went back to the coast where even though the sacred sites are covered by structures and places, it doesn't stop the elder brothers from doing what they've always done, praying for our collective well-being. They use that phrase, elder brothers, and they dismiss us, who they think have ruined the world, as the younger brother. Well, after four or five years in the South America, I was always looking for a change. And um, I was summoned one day to Schulte's office in 1982, and he asked me casually whether I was interested in going down to the Caribbean island nation of Haiti, infiltrating the secret societies, and securing the formula of the folk poison used to make zombies. Well, of course, I, I said, sure. Uh, and I went down to Haiti uh, almost on a lark, having no idea that this project would end up consuming four years of my life, because within days of being in the African reality, something was made possible to me or available to me that had eluded me in South America, and that was truly a window wide open to the mystic. You know, why do we think of voodoo as being a black magic cult? It's simply a fall word from Dahomey that means spirit or God. You know, why is it that when we're asked to name the great religions of the world, there's one whole continent that we leave out? And voodoo is simply uh, the religious ideas of Africa, and it's fundamentally based on this idea that human beings give birth to the spirits, the spirits are the manifestation of a greater God, but in a quintessentially democratic faith, the spirits must be made to serve the living. To serve the living, they must become manifest. To become manifest, they must respond to the rhythm of the drum to come back to earth to momentarily displace the living. So for that brief shining moment, human being and God become one and the same. That's why Haitians say, you white people go to church and speak about God. We dance in the temple and become God. And when you are taken by the spirit, you cannot be harmed. And that's why you see these somewhat theatrical displays, handling burning embers with impunity, a rather astonishing example of the mind's ability to affect the body that bears it when catalyzed in a state of extreme excitation. Well, we have this idea that these cultures, quaint and colorful though they may be, are somehow destined to fade away as if by natural law, as if they're failed attempts at keeping up with history. And nothing could be further from the truth. Technology is no threat to culture. Change is no threat to culture. What is a threat to culture is power. In every case, these are dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And that's actually an optimistic observation because it suggests that if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can surely be the facilitators of cultural survival. And I wrote a book about my misadventures in Haiti that was made into the worst Hollywood movie in history. And Hemingway said that if you sell a book to Hollywood, you should start off in Tucson, um, go to the California state line, throw the book over, and go back to Arizona and have a drink. Uh, I didn't do that. I disappeared in the forest of Borneo. I wanted to live in a place wet with the innocence of birth. I wanted to live with nomads because we were all once wanders on a pristine planet. And nomadic societies are profoundly different. How do you measure wealth when there's a disincentive to accumulate anything? Wealth for the Penan is defined explicitly as the strength of social relations between people, because without those bonds, everybody suffers. Sharing is an involuntary reflex, because you never know who will be the next to bring food to the table. There is no word for thank you in the Penan language. I once gave a cigarette to a Penan woman and watched as she tore it apart to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably to every hut in the encampment, rendering the product useless, honoring her obligation to share. Sadly, by the time I reached Borneo in the late 1980s, the sounds of the forest had become the sounds of machinery. 
highest rate of tropical deforestation in the world. In a single generation, rivers that once ran clear became so laden with silt that it seemed as if all of Borneo was slipping away to the South China Sea. Women reduced to servitude, children into forced settlement camps, men standing up, blowpipes against bulldozers, no match for the power of the Malaysian state. And in one generation, a way of life morally inspired, inherently right, was crushed along with the force that gave it birth. Now, it wasn't just crushed randomly. It was crushed by a certain ideology, a certain worldview. And let me take you to the antithetical worldview by entering the back lands of Australia. When the British first went to Australia, they saw people that looked strange, had a simple material technology, but what really offended the British was that the Aboriginal people had no interest in progress, in material improvement. Now, we know from studies of the Y chromosome that the, these were the first human beings to walk out of Africa. 5,000 years after leaving Africa, they crossed the water to the most parsimonious continent on Earth, and then they went walking. And they established 10,000 clan territories, all linked by a single idea, the dreaming. And the dreaming wasn't a dream. It was a philosophical devotion that maintained that the world both existed and was always waiting to be born. The entire purpose of life in Australia was not to change anything. Now, this was beyond the reach of the British. And their response instead was to conclude that these people weren't human at all. And as recently as 1902, in the lifetime of my grandfather, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether or not Aboriginal people were human or not. As recently as the 1950s, when I was a little boy, ranchers had quotas of how many they could shoot with impunity who trespassed upon their seized land. In the 1960s, a book used across schools in Australia, a treasury of fauna of Australia, included the Aboriginal people as amongst the interesting forms of wildlife in the continent. What was really going on was a failure to grasp that the entire purpose of life in Australia was the antithesis of progress. It was stasis, constancy. The entire purpose of life was to do nothing to change the world, only to do the ritual gestures necessary, in fact, to keep the world exactly as it had been since the time of the Rainbow Serpent. It would be as if all of our scientific genius had been invested in pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. Now again, I'm not saying who's right and wrong. Had we followed this trajectory, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon. But on the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about climate change and our capacity to transform the physical and biological life support systems of the planet. So if crude industrial policy is one threat to culture, the most pernicious is ideology, be it the cult of modernity or the Marxist madness of the Maoists in Beijing. Here's a woman you can see in Cambodia who's had her feet and hands severed from her body for the crime of pursuing her religious faith during the era of Pol Pot. Entering Tibet, we see the consequence when a young Dalai Lama was told by Mao Zedong that all religion was poison. Remember that Mao Zedong is a man who was responsible for the death of more of his own people in his lifetime than Hitler and Stalin combined. And when he famously said to the Dalai Lama that all religion was poison, His Holiness knew what to expect. And as the Chinese entered Tibet, 1.2 million people would be killed, 6,000 temples destroyed. And what was it about the Buddhist Dharma that so threatened the Marxist materialists of Beijing? Not because they were Chinese, but because they had an ideology that had been invented and distilled in the British Library in Europe that was the epitome of Western uh, conceits, the idea that you could somehow manipulate uh, the social being of humanity. The Dharma is based simply on the Four Noble Truths, all life is suffering them. But that, the Buddha, didn't mean that all life was negation, just that shit happens. The cause of suffering was ignorance. By that, the Buddha didn't mean stupidity. He meant the tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of our own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the noble truths was the revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And of course, the fourth and most consequential was the delineation of a contemplative practice that if pursued, not only had the possibility of a transformation of the human heart, but had 2,500 years of evidence that that transformation would in fact happen. And so, oops. 
There we go. And so we decided to make a film called The Buddhist Science of the Mind. Why the word science? Well, what is science but the empirical pursuit of the truth? What is Buddhism but 2,500 years of empirical observation as to the nature of mind? And I traveled with this good friend of mine. I don't know if you know Matthew Ricard. He's the translator for His Holiness in Europe. His father was France's most legendary Descartian philosopher. His mother was a famous painter. He grew up in Paris in a house of luminaries. He learned photography from Henri Cartier-Bresson. Stravinsky taught him to play piano. He learned anthropology at the feet of Claude Lévi-Strauss. He was a molecular biologist in the lab of a Nobel laureate at the Pasteur Institute outside of Paris when he realized there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness. So he went back to the place he'd always been happy and became ordained as a Tibetan monk. And to be with him in the Himalaya was like being with Friar Tuck in Sherwood Forest. Also with us was Cheryl Bama, a traditional Amstie doctor, seen here quizzically examining my urine sample. <laughs> And under the blessing of the late Teresa Rinpoche, head of the Nima tradition, we went on a journey of the heart. Cher had been, had been treated the most remarkable of women. As a young girl, she had been so beautiful that her family had no choice but to betroth her to a wealthy merchant. But she wanted the life of the Dharma. To escape his clutches, she crawled down a human latrine, covered with human excrement, turned up at the Tempoche Monastery, where they cleaned her up, dispatched her over the 23,000 foot Nangpala Pass into Tibet. She became ordained as a Tibetan nun and crossed back over, and then she went into lifelong retreat. And for 45 years, as Sasampa Ani, she had lived in a cell no bigger than the corner of this room, with her meals being brought to her every day. Her entire sentient existence committed to the recitation of a single mantra, a single prayer. And she was elderly, and we had a chance to go and meet her. We began at Chirong, which clings like a swallow's nest to the southern side of the Himalaya, during the Mani Windu ceremony that commemorates in 18 days the transmission of the Dharma to Tibet by Guru Rinpoche. We began to make our way towards and beyond Everest, not doing what most Westerners do, climbing that mountain into a zone of oxygen deprivation so profound that consciousness is obliterated, which is, from the Tibetan point of view, just about the stupidest thing you can do with a precious incarnation. We went in pursuit of a bodhisattva, an Eastern hero, if you will. Past the cave, where as part of his seven years of medical training, Sherb spent one year in solitary meditative retreat. And with Machu chanting the sutras, we came closer and closer. In this next photograph I took, the instant that sunlight fell on this woman's face for the first time in 45 years. And by the terms of reference of our society, she ought to have been mad. But instead, the face that greeted me radiated loving compassion. And it was at that point that Matthew said, this is the proof of the efficacy of the science of the mind that is Tibetan Buddhism, the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And that night, at a nearby monastery, a lama said to me, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And so the Tibetans chart their future on the verses of the Diamond Sutra that says that life is like a candle in the wind, the dawn fading to the day. And they leave it to us to ask why we tolerate the wrath of China that continues to do so much to dismantle a tradition that has given so much to the world. So in the end, we kind of have a choice. What kind of world do we want to live in? A monochromatic world of monotony or a polychromatic world of diversity? Margaret Mead said that her greatest fear that it was as we drifted toward this blandly amorphous world, not only would the entire range of the human spirit be reduced to a narrow modality of thought, but we'd wake one day as from a dream, having forgotten that there are possibilities for life itself. The issue isn't the traditional versus the modern, it's the rights of free people to choose the components of their lives. It's not about keeping anyone from the benefits of modernity, but how can we assure that all peoples have the benefits of modernity without that engagement having to demand the death of their ethnicity. Because culture is not trivial. It's not decorative. Culture fundamentally is a body of moral and ethical values that every culture places around each individual to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies within all of us. It's culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, to reach as Lincoln said, for the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost, and individuals through coercion or volition 
turn their backs on tradition, often to achieve a place only on the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere, you simply have to look at the points of chaos around the world. Now, nation states finally are becoming hip to this and realizing that indigenous people don't threaten the nation state, they enhance it if the state's prepared to accept diversity. When the British reached the Arctic of Canada, they took the Inuit to be savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both were wrong. There was no better measure of genius than the ability to survive in this harsh environment on a technology that was limited to what you could forge from the cold. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. Their sleds were made of meat, of fish. Peter Freiken famously remarked that the great thing about traveling in the Arctic is that if you ran out of food, you could always eat your sled. This night, I took this photograph of polar bear hunting 250 kilometers on the ice beyond Oglulik. That night, the temperature dropped to minus 65 Celsius, and they simply built an igloo, and we ate meat. And despite what Greenpeace says, blood on ice in the Arctic is not a sign of death, it's an affirmation of life. And when I was now hunting at the tip of Baffin Island, I recorded a story from this family that was remarkable. The, in the 1950s, when we tried to force the Inuit in the settlements, this man's grandfather, Olaik, refused to go. The family took away with all of his weapons and tools, thinking that would force the old man of the settlement. And instead, he slipped out of the igloo, pulled down his caribou hide trousers, and defecated into his hand. As the feces froze, he shaped it in the form of an implement. When the implement forged by the cold from human waste took final shape, he put a spray of saliva along the leading edge and used a ship knife to kill a dog. He skinned a dog, improvised a sled from the carcass of the dead dog, disappeared into the Arctic night. Talk about getting by with nothing. And I thought they were pulling my leg until I read in the journals of Peter Freakin that when he got trapped out on the barrens and pulled his sled on top of him in, in inadvertently made a coffin of his own making. He was completely trapped, and in his journal said, he says, I thought of making a ship knife, but I really couldn't maneuver. No one's suggesting there's an assembly line creating ship knives in the Arctic, but that's how frost is used. And ice is consciousness. In fact, the word sila in the dialect of the polar Eskimo of the northernmost community of the world, Kanak, means both weather and consciousness. And of course, this is a photograph I took in Kanak in the northwest tip of Greenland. And here the ice used to come in in September and stay to July, but now it comes in in November and is gone by March. So the entire way of life in the Arctic is melting from beneath them. And so let me just close with one quick story. In the wake of 9-11, I wanted to tell a story about Islam, particularly for the American audience. And so we traveled to Timbuktu to tell a story of both knowledge and of the sacred salt of the desert. And Timbuktu, of course, is the port on the shores of the Sea of Sand of the Western Sahara. At a time when Paris and London were small towns, Timbuktu had 125,000 people and over 25,000 students in 120 institutions of higher learning. It rivaled Damascus and Cairo and Baghdad as centers of Islamic knowledge. And in fact, the manuscripts of Timbuktu reveal to us that the entire knowledge of the uh, of, the, of, of the ancient Greeks only survived to reach the, and inspire the Renaissance because it was codified and by the great Islamic scholars. And so you can hold in Timbuktu in your hand these documents that go back to the 11th century embossed in gold that speak of chemistry and cosmology and astronomy and botany. And then from Timbuktu we traveled north into the desert to an ancient salt mine called Taudeni. Now, until the discovery of the New World, recall that two-thirds of Europe's gold came from West Africa, overland 52 days from Timbuktu to Marrakesh. That was the route that we retraced. And we got to the ancient mine, and you cannot become an adult male if you're Tamachek or Torg unless you've done this ordeal to the mine, 20 days each way across the desert. We had this motley assembly of characters. We didn't really know who anyone was. Uh, but five times a day, in the absence of water, we would watch as they bathed their faces and hands and feet with the dry sands of the Sahara. The mine itself was a kind of biblical scene. My friend Isa Muhammad took one look and said, I would not bring my wife here. I asked some of the truck smugglers where they had come from, and they said, there are no countries here. And two things happened before we left the mine, which were incredible. 
I met this man who was chronologically younger than me, but his body was broken from 40 years in the pits. He was there on a system of debt peonage. He had lent money to a money lender to save the life of his little girl, and he had never been able to escape bondage. And when I calculated his debt, he was never going to escape bondage, and yet his debt was less than the cost of a good minor, dinner for four here in Vancouver. So my friend Chris and I gave him the money. He blessed Allah, and then suddenly as we walked away, a windstorm came through. He disappeared into a veil of yellow mist, a sandstorm. And we never found out whether he got his freedom, whether he was telling us the truth, or whether he was killed for the money. But on the way south, we came upon a caravan we had met going north. And the rains that had hit our camp had hit their camp. And if the salt gets wet, remember this is salt that once traded ounce for ounce with gold. If the salt gets wet, it breaks and loses all value. So we came upon eight young men with all the wealth of their family who had been forced to stop in the desert and let the salt dry out. Five precious days, and they had run out of all supplies. The water was down to half a liter of water. And what did they do as soon as we came upon their camp? They kindled a fire and brewed us tea with their last half liter of water, honoring the Bedouin saying that you will kill the last goat that gives the milk that keeps your children alive to feed a wandering stranger who comes out of the darkness because you never know when you will come out of the darkness. Now remember, thirst can kill in 12 hours. There's a saying in the Sahara that the great thing of about um, brake fluid is that it keeps you off the battery acid. So as I watched Muhammad pour me this first cup of tea, I thought to myself, after all my work, all my years, all my research, this is what it's all about, because these are the moments that allow all of us to hope. Thanks very much. I, don't, I think, we've, you know, some of you may have to go. Um, please do. Um, I think there's a class coming in at two, so we have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, please. And try to take questions from the students first. Oh, I always do. But who's, who's not a student, anyway? Go ahead. Um, so anthropology has a, a very rich history, but often a very Western history, where it was scholars from Europe going to uncontacted tribes or uncontacted peoples and you know, cataloging them in a way. So I was wondering if you could see how, mention about how you see kind of the growth of anthropology from well, you know, anthro Western science. You know, I, I, mean, I think that's a very old view of anthropology. You know, I mean, anthropology began in the 19th century. I mean, the first chair in anthropology wasn't until about 1870. And it began inspired by Darwin. And the whole idea was that if species evolved, surely societies evolved and cultures evolved. And that this idea that we, you know, this sort of evolutionary idea celebrated by armchair anthropologists responding to mission reports and journals that, that, that basically attempted to see um, these were men who were highly critical of their own culture, but incapable of being outside of their culture. And so, you know, remember, this is an era when the superiority of the white male was accepted with such assurance that there was no word for what we call racism today in the English language. And there was a sense that we went out initially, you know, to try to find cultures that had nothing in common with our own, save the very fact of being human, and that somehow from that engagement, we might learn something about the nature of being alive. But very quickly, that kind of morphed. And remember the term survival of the fittest was invented not by Darwin, but by Spencer, an anthropologist. And there was this idea that if cultures evolved, we could kind of put every culture on an imaginary, like a theater piece, on an imaginary evolutionary ascent line to us, right? And largely that was driven because a measure of success was always technology, as it is to this day. You know, and um, and of course that was a, a very convenient model during an era when human beings were still used as slaves, and when even in British class society, 
uh, I found this out when I wrote about the Great War. Do you realize on the eve of World War I, the British Army discovered that the average height of an enlisted man in the Army was, five, was six inches shorter than the average height of an officer, which is simply a reflection of nutrition and class. So this, these were, these were a, 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 cool, a, a kind of uh, easy convenience in that kind of era. And this is where, where Canada really plays an important role because there was one, one man who saw things very differently. And Franz Boas was actually a physicist and he did his PhD on the optical properties of light. And somehow in his experiments he saw that the, his results were affected by his point of view. And I'm not sure how that actually worked in terms of his actual experiments, but that's what he wrote about later. And he began in that kind of marvelously eclectic way of 19th century scholarship where you know, insights in one field could inspire another. He began to think of this thing called culture. He was the first to use the term culture to try to define a, a, a group of people. And his break, breakthrough happened in Canada when he was on Baffin Island and he got caught out in a blizzard with the Inuit and he realized what geniuses they were and how helpless he was. And then of course he did all his work on the northwest coast when he saw the, 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 the whole idea that you could have high civilization in the absence of the cult of the seed. And it was Boaz who first spoke about what we now call modern anthropology, that the, the obligation is to get inside the culture to the extent that you can, to show its point of view, you know, participant observation, learning the language. So all that we think of a modern anthropology. And Boaz was always an activist. Margaret Mead was a student. Ruth Bennett was a student. And I would say, if anything, modern anthropology has dropped that banner, right? We now find it convenient to study, you know, the anthropology of a bus station in Vancouver. Why? Because it's comfortable. We don't have to leave home. It's cheap. You know, but the, the, the real glory of anthropology, I think, are men and women from all cultures. It's not just white men anymore going out and telling these stories of culture, often at tremendous uh, personal sacrifice. Uh, and I say that as someone who never did it. You know, I mean, I was always a storyteller and a botanist, so I was crossing geography through, mo that's why I've been so many places, but people like Stephen Hugh Jones, who devoted his entire life to the worldview of the Bodhisattva, so that that, that worldview will be known to the world. I think these people are heroes, and I think anthropology has been horribly remiss at its main mandate. Look, in the immediate wake of 9-11, I was living in Washington, D.C. The biggest story of culture the United States would ever face, the American Anthropological Association met within a month of that disaster, 4,000 anthropologists in town in the wake of 9-11, and the entire gathering merited a single line in the Washington Post newspaper in the gossip section that basically said the nutcases are in town again. And you didn't know who was more remiss, the American government for not listening to the one discipline that could have answered the question on the lips of all Americans, why do they hate us? Or worse, the discipline itself, who had no capacity whatsoever to reach outside of itself to speak to the public at large. And that really has been the reason that Forbes magazine, for example, four years ago said that anthropology was the worst undergraduate major if you wanted to be relevant or have a job. I mean, of course that assertion was idiotic as if the study of humanity was deemed to be bad preparation for life in whatever field of endeavor you embrace, but that's really the fault of anthropology because it has been buried in theoretical nonsense and I'm the only one, who, because I'm not really an academic, gets away with saying it, you know. Uh, but but th what, we, what we need to be doing as, you know, I, I, here's another example. You, 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 none of them asked this question, but this is a critical one. If it's true that the anthropologists all, are, are the linguists are all right, if half the languages of the world are disappearing, here's the obvious question. Why aren't people screaming about it? And the answer is very simple. Two words, Noam Chomsky. I don't know if you know the story, but Noam Chomsky was, was, when I was in college, he was a darling of the new left. He was the one professor from MIT that we could always count on to address our anti-war rallies. And this burnished his already formidable credentials as the greatest linguist of his age. And his original insights were genius. He basically said the obvious. You know, people were concerned about the acquisition of language, and they always invoked Skinner, and so that somehow people acquired language by, you know, rewards, like you, you, you said mama, and I give you a cookie. Well, he said the obvious, we think now, you know, that language acquisition is an incredibly complex 
um, phenomenon. It occurs at roughly the same age in cultures around the world. And he posited that the human brain was somehow hardwired for language acquisition. And he called this a universal grammar. He didn't suggest it was a physical organ, but it was a cognitive organ that could be studied through theoretical analysis. And such was his influence that that became the only way that linguistics operated. It's a little bit like the analogy of genotype and phenotype in, in biology. You know, if I want to study DNA, I can use fruit fly DNA. I don't have to use panda bear DNA because the structure of DNA is basically the same. Why bother to go to look for panda bears, let's leave that to the conservation biologists and the, the ecologists. Well, basically what he was saying is why bother to go off and try to document all these dying languages when it doesn't really matter. That's just a phenotypic expression of what the key thing is, is the universal grammar. All of our energy should go on that. And, and the consequence of, of that was that, was that no one was encouraged to do field work amongst these languages. If you gave me limitless funds today to document the 3,500 languages that are considered severely threatened, I could not do it because there aren't enough linguists know, who know how to do that. Because you cannot get a PhD by studying syntax or grammar or compiling dictionaries. And so we have libraries full of utterly irrelevant linguistic theses that will never see the light of day. And every two weeks, an elder passes away and brings a language into the ground. And in 1998, uh, when I began to speak of language loss, I could get away with it because I had the bully pulpit of the geographic and I wasn't an academic linguist. Mercifully, there were two men, Michael Krauss at University of Fairbanks and Ken Hale at MIT. And in 1992, Michael Krauss published what I think is one of the most important academic papers in the history of the social sciences, The World's Languages in Crisis. And he was a, one, a lone voice in the wild. And then I could use the bully pulpit of the geographic. And meanwhile, there was this growing um, movement in the next generation of linguists, like the wonderful people we have here, Mark Turin, uh, Pat Shaw, um, 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 David Crystal, David Harrison, you know, and these guys were, were, and women were just, in a sense, waiting for the dam to break. And, and so in the first decade of the 2000, 2010, suddenly there were probably 40 books that came out on language loss, NGOs popping up all over the place dedicated to this issue, even nation states focused on it finally. But that shows you the hold that one academic can, can have. And uh, not that Chomsky's not a brilliant guy and not a bad guy. It's just that in that area, I think he was profoundly wrong. Any other, any other questions? Or please feel free to go. Yeah.